Thank you very much, Minori. Um, so this morning, um, I and Yannicka here will lead in a guided meditation. And then after the meditation, I'll give a, a talk. So, and then open it to question and answer. So welcome everyone. It's uh, nice to see uh, new faces that I haven't seen before in the Dhamma. And uh, I'll turn it over to Aya. So get yourselves in a comfortable position for meditation and she'll give you some guidance. Yeah, so feel free to um, adjust adjust your posture to something you can hold for about a half hour comfortably, but alertedly. So something that you can uh, maintain some awareness. So a lot of times uh, it's good to to feel the surface that we're sitting or lying or standing on. Knowing that we've got that support below us. And then in whatever manner feels appropriate to, to straighten, become a little more upright, and then relax. Relax into the support below us. Relax into the structure of our bones and muscles, sinews that keep us in an upright posture, whatever that means for your cushion, chair, standing, or lying down posture. And the quality of our attention is a quality of kindness. You know, as we, as we sense this body in contact with the surface below us, as we feel the parts of the body stacking up, to hold a posture for this next time period. Can we attend to it with kindness? Can we relax and be willing to be with things as they are? And as we begin this scan through the body, can we start with a warmth in the heart? I like to think of a smile in my eyes, that my whole face is soft and welcoming, attending with kindness. Sensing directly the body So we begin maybe at the top today, top of the head, this awareness of the surface of the head, maybe feeling air currents meeting our hair or our shaved scalps. into the direct experience. Noticing and allowing a softness to occur just out of loving awareness. Down into the face often around the eyes, giving the eyes this warm-hearted smile, just letting them be, whether the lids are closed or partly open, just letting it be, accepting it, showing up for how it is.
And the same down the face, around the nose, the nostrils. Even the movement in our sinuses. The quality of attention is care, kindness, relaxed warmth, even love. Bringing this quality of metta down into our lips and jaw, especially the tongue, letting the tongue be soft, just taking up the space, gently resting. Down into the throat, the entirety of the neck. Allowing a small movement if there's a sense of any pinching, you know, knowing we're not necessarily going to have total ease, but we can have ease in the way we attend to the neck and the throat as it is right now. Accepting with care. Down into the shoulders. Cross to the tips of each shoulder and down the arms, both at the same time. Just letting the qualities be and any micro or larger adjustments that give us a little bit more ease. Accepting as it is, but also bringing this loving attention to minor adjustments that might be of support. A real sense of care, a brightness of attention, seeped in metta, seeped in loving kindness. All the way down to the hands. Just seeing, feeling, sensing the sensations of the hands. Even a sense of breathing, a relaxed, warm breathing into the hands. Going back up to the top of the torso, down into the upper chest cavity, the ribs, the movement of the lungs, the movement of the heart. Sensing what's present. And into the belly, knowing there's the spine supporting us and the belly with all its softness. Letting it be as soft as it can right now and accepting it as it is. Down into the hips, pelvis, buttocks. A soft quality of attention, curious, warm, accepting. And into the joint, down into the legs, both legs, sensing down to the knees. Further down toward the ankles.
Noticing the qualities that are present. Attending to them with care. And these feet. Awareness of the feet as they are. Any little minor adjustments that bring just a bit more ease. And then an accepting warmth for the qualities of the feet right now. Expanding back to be aware of the full body. Maybe there's already a warmth in the heart that you feel radiating out to all of the body. If not, you can call that metta practice to mind, that warmth of the heart, a friendly kindness, and direct it towards this body in its totality, the experience of being in a body here in practice. Aware where there are pleasant and unpleasant sensations, neutral sensations. But looking on all of them with this sense of, it's like this, it's like this. And I can accept and be with things as they are. Being in this body at this moment is like this. And relaxing into that awareness. You're welcome to continue just this practice of awareness attending with warmth and kindness. Or if you commonly have a, an object of meditation like the breath or elements or any other thing, welcome to turn directly to those objects with this same attentive, kind quality of attention. And we'll continue in silence.
if tension or aversion or a grasping has arisen in any way, can we renew that quality of gentle, kind curiosity, that kind attention? Can we renew the warmth of our gaze within our meditation? Letting things be as they are. A loving, kind quality to our attention, our awareness.
As we approach the end of this meditation time, turning the mind back toward this last half hour, but turning it with kindness, curiosity. How was this particular session? What qualities were present? Using discernment, we can sense our practice over time and let the discernment also have this warm-hearted quality so we can be open to wisdom as it arises. So take a few minutes to reflect. and embrace and hold as we approach the end of this time. Thank you, Ayanika. Where have you get me a glass of water, please? So uh, now we're going to shift to a uh, Dhamma reflection. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa. Bhutam damam sankham namasami. So, thank you. Um, today or this evening? This evening, I guess for some of you, it's uh, still morning here in Cal in, in Washington, uh, Pacific Northwest. Um, I thought to speak about uh, the self and non-self. And I and Ianika was encouraging us to uh, look at our both our hearts and our bodies with kindness. So this is very suitable. Um, it seems like uh, many people have a difficult time with self-love. So this is part of what I wanted to address. And also the, um, this contemplation of non-self. This is like a, I started out in the Zen tradition and there was uh, the three marks of existence. And that was like uh, impermanence, suffering, and non-self. And in the Vajrayana, there's the same uh, three and uh, they call them the three characteristics in Theravada tradition. So um, there's this non-self thing that uh, sub puzzling maybe it's just like a dukkha we can see very clearly <laughs> impermanence uh to a certain extent we we understand that that's pretty easy and uh, then we have this issue of not self <laughs> which is seems to be unique to buddhism and um it's anatta so uh, you'll hear anicca anatta uh, dukkha uh anicca Anatta, or some combination of the three. They all work together. They're 
uh, insight practices. And then people uh, who are uh, converts, as, as, as some of us are called, that are, uh, you know, weren't raised as Buddhists, we just kind of jump into insight practice, <laughs> or we, or we try to get to, to, you know, like we, it's like, um, uh, instead of starting with the fundamentals, many of us are introduced to Buddhism through uh, meditation practices, which is part. It's like uh, the wisdom practices, the insight practices, and the um, samatha, samadhi. This is all part of the path, but it's like <laughs> samadhi is the eighth fold of the path. And uh, samaditi contains a, the in, insight practices. And uh, But it isn't until full liberation of mind that we can fully penetrate <laughs> the anatta. Um, there's still this conceit of I am that lingers with us. Maybe at stream entry, we let go of personality view. And so we're hearing about the five aggregates. <laughs> and and there's a, a the five aggregates are uh, body, feeling, perception of, yeah, perception, uh, volitional formations, and consciousness. And then in a, a monastery, you might be chanting in Pali, the body is not self, feelings are not self, perception is not self, mental formations are not self, consciousness is not self. And you might think, oh, what is that all about? <laughs> How does that relate to my life? And then um, the teachings on impermanence, uh, these all feed into the non-self. So we can say, okay, well, yeah, I can see how this is all in flux, right? And um, so, so then people just kind of really dig into these, these this kind of uh, reflections, and and um, they think this is sometimes it, it. We might think this is all of Buddhism, you know, and then we start hearing. It depends on how you've entered. Some people start with the with the four Brahma Viharas, right? Uh, and so we hear about loving kindness and, and compassion and altruistic joy and equanimity. And how is this self included in that? <laughs> if, if there's no self. And so so sometimes there's this people um get uh anxious when they start having to direct, I don't know how many people when I and Yannicka was doing the guided meditation are feeling like, how can I direct this loving kindness to this body or this, this self of mine? <laughs> and some people really struggle with that because um, in the Western culture, uh, a lot, there's a lot of people don't have self-love. In fact, uh, there's this confusion, but Self-hatred is not a virtue. <laughs> low health self well low self esteem is not a virtue. And and there's this confusion about that. It, and it's not, it isn't non-self either. You might get annihilationism or self, uh self-hatred getting scrambled into this new concept of non-self because we don't, it's something. Uh, foreign to most of us, and uh, so this is this is a difficulty. This is a it can be very painful. And I remember uh, when I started out uh, doing metta practice, and somebody told me to direct loving kindness towards my heart. Uh, I felt so much pain there. It was so difficult, so painful, and I. Uh, I struggled with it, and I, I remember on the cushion crying. I ended up with crying. Um, but first, there was like this real resistance, like, go away, leave me alone, when I was directing the loving kindness to my heart. And uh, and then I just, I persisted like like a, a, a mother with a, a child that's having a temper tam tantrum and saying, no, I'm not going to go away. I love you. And they're like, no, go away. 
and eventually the child will settle down. Uh, and, oh, and that's when the tears just started pouring out. It's just, uh, and so sometimes we have to go through that in order uh, to start bringing love to ourselves. Um, because uh, you know, a lot of people think that loving kindness is uh, sending out love out to everyone else in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> but he can't say all beings except for me. <laughs> I'm, I'm the only one that, that doesn't deserve that love. So um, so this is uh, very important to consider, to, to look at honestly what's going on. If we're, we have this obstacle, not everybody does, but I, I, I hear this frequently and I've experienced it myself, that people have uh, difficulty with Meta for themselves, love for themselves, and then, but they're very merrily looking at non-self, and this is actually dangerous because, like I was saying, it could be confused with annihilationism or self-hatred or low self-esteem, and these things can creep into that if we don't have a firm foundation in meta for oneself. If we have meta for oneself, then we can deeply. Uh, give ha have loving kindness for others. So um, in the time of the Buddha, it was assumed that uh, people had love for themselves. And actually, um, many cultures, it's true. That it's kind of a puzzle when when uh, like I've heard that His Holiness the Dalai Lama, I read this, uh, he was uh, with a group of psychologists and one of the psychologists said, uh, what do we do about low self-esteem? And His Holiness the Dalai Lama speaks fairly good English, but he had a translator there and he said, asked the translator, what are they talking about? <laughs> and the translator said something and the translator may have been more westernized too and knew a little bit more about Western culture and started translating in Tibetan what they were saying. And His Holiness was kind of astounded. He said, you mean they don't love themselves? And that was kind of shocking. <laughs> so... Um, so we may have uh, this self, low self-esteem, or we may even in, in cultures that say that we have to put ourselves down and put other people up, or whatever position we have, there, there's that conceit of I am either uh, less than, equal to, or greater than. It's all uh, has I am in there, and so it's not it's not better than being inflated. Deflating oneself is, 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 is not a virtue. Uh, so uh, I wanted to uh, share something that's in the Buddhist teaching that's a, a very sweet uh, story. It's in the Samyutta Nikaya. And uh, it's about how important this self-love is. In one way, it's talked about in the suttas. And there's a story that the King Pasenadi and his beloved wife, Malika, and they were in the uh, up, upstairs balcony of the, uh, the stilt longhouse where the Buddha was staying. And uh, King Pasenadi went to his beloved wife and he said, darling, is there anyone who you hold more dear than yourself? And being the husband, he might have hoped that she said, oh, you, darling. But instead, she said, no, there is no one I hold more dear than myself. How about you? <laughs> Something to that effect. And then he said, oh, no, actually, there is no one that I hold more dear than myself. So then he went down uh, stairs and he found the Buddha and he reported uh, this conversation he had with his wife. And uh, I have the, there's a, a uh, the response to the Buddha here that's uh, from, it's the Malika Sutta and the Samyutta Nikaya 3.8. The, 
Then King Pasenadi of Kosala came downstairs from the stilt longhouse, went to the Buddha, bowed, sat down to one side, and told him what had happened. Then, understanding this matter, on that occasion, the Buddha recited this verse. Having explored every quarter with the mind, one finds no one dearer than oneself. Likewise, for others, each holds one themselves dear. So, one who loves themselves would harm no other. So, this using ourself as a model uh, that we would want to care for ourselves and protect ourselves, and, and uh, you bec start becoming more sensitive and seeing that in all beings. That the all beings, like even the smallest ant, if you you know, like in the kitchen, and you have a, there's an ant, and then you try to move it carefully outside. You see how frightened it is. How much they cherish their own lives, and so uh, this. Uh, caring for ourselves. This is caring for ourselves. We care for others. If we truly love ourselves, then uh, we wouldn't want to harm other living beings. Uh, part of the self-love I've been uh, reflecting on, you know, it's wonderful to, to say words of kindness to ourselves, but also... Um, ways to care for ourselves in this practice is to abandon unwholesome quality. So abandoning uh, any kind of cruelty, this starting with uh, abandoning cruelty to other beings, knowing that, you know, I don't want to be harmed. I don't want, you know, I want also uh, keeping the precepts, five precepts, knowing that I will I wouldn't like anything stolen from me. I wouldn't want people to lie to me. I want, you know, I want. I would, I would like to be uh, honest. I would like to be kind. I would uh, keeping all the precepts is non-harming. So we have not killing, not stealing, not lying, uh, not engaging in any kind of sexual activity that's harmful to another person, and to abstain from intoxicants. So this is a kindness to ourselves. If we keep these precepts well, and a kindness to others. So this is a, a way to, to love ourselves, actually, and um, non-harming ourselves, not harming ourselves. Uh, we don't harm others. So there's developing the uh, the sila, the ethical co uh, conduct, and developing uh, other wholesome qualities, compassion, uh, wisdom, or uh, understanding. This is a true love for ourselves. So abandoning the unwholesome and cultivating the wholesome. The the, the Buddha, when he was a bodhisattva. He actually examined his own mind, and he saw both wholesome and unwholesome qualities of mind. And he did see, this is in the uh, Dweda Vitaka Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya 19. He, he examined his own mind before his awakening. He saw these qualities. So then he saw the harm in the unwholesome, and he saw the um, benefit of the wholesome qualities of mind. So... Naturally, when you see the the harm that these unwholesome qualities have that are spring out of greed, hate, and delusion, then naturally we'll want to abandon them. And naturally, when we see the benefit, the purification of the, the wholesome qualities, opposite of greed, hate, and delusion would be generosity, loving kindness, uh, and wisdom, actually. Um, So caring for ourselves well, we care for others. And caring for our minds. I have some Dhammapada verses here. 
that also talk about the self. This is there's a section on the self in the Dhammapada. Uh, this is starting with the uh, verse 157 on the uh, the chapter on the self. And uh, I have Bhante Sujato's translation here. If you'd only love yourself, you look after yourself right well in one of the night's three watches. An astute person would remain alert. So the three watches could be considered the two, three phases of our lives, that, you know, youth and middle age and old age, or just being alert when we're awake, whenever we are awake. Uh, and there's another translation of that same verse here. If one holds oneself dear, one should diligently watch oneself. Let the wise person keep vigil during any of the three watches of the night. So looking after our own hearts, our own minds, whenever we're awake. And this is uh, verse 158. The astute would avoid being corrupted by grounding themselves first in all what is suitable and only then instructing others. If one so acts as one instructs, the well-tamed would tame others, for the self is hard to tame. So this is a gradual path and we're, uh, it's like uh, raising a child or, or taming a tameable animal, like a horse or something. Uh, and this, there's uh, two more verses, um, of two more translations of the last verse that I have selected for this. Self is indeed the Lord of self, for who else would one's Lord be? When oneself is well tamed, one gains a Lord that is rare indeed. And that's Sujato's translation. And this is Acharya Buddha Rakita's translation. That was the other, the alternate translation I had read previously to. One truly is the protector of oneself. Who else could the protector be? With oneself fully controlled, one gains a mastery that is hard to gain. So this interesting taming and training oneself. So uh, we love ourselves, but we can also be very honest with ourselves and and see our rough edges and be, you know, accept. We accept. I think Vajin Brahm has something about uh, recognizing and our acknowledging and uh, learning from that experience. I, I, there's some three words I can't remember right now. <laughs> Maybe my tree remembers them, but, um, but, but we acknowledge uh, when we have shortcomings or we know, acknowledge like a, I see anger ari arising in me and I'll say, oh, I see this anger arising in me. And then I think if I were to speak or act on this anger, would that be helpful? No. And as I'm sitting here or standing, whatever, where position I'm in, with this anger arising in me, is is this so helpful to me to nurture it? No. <laughs> so I just look at it and I can feel it in my body. Uh, and then I can allow it to pass. And then uh, it's it's a training, and uh, we find ourselves again and again and again with the unwholesome mental states rising, or we may speak out of uh, anger, or speak out of greed, act out of anger, or greed, or delusion, and then uh, 
maybe we can make amends or and uh maybe not but we have to keep aware of when the unwholesome arises and also actively cultivate the wholesome this is very important so when we think about I see that anger is a kind of a predominant kalesa or <laughs> unwholesome mental activity. I see it arising again and again. So I work with the, either compassion or, or loving kindness uh, towards myself, have compassion towards myself, and then uh, forgiveness also. And then uh, if I'm forgiving and uh, compassionate towards myself, it's much easier to be more compassionate towards other people. If I have too high expectations of myself, I'll have high expectations of others. So um, I'll see somebody really angry and I'll go, oh, I remember when I got that angry. Uh, sometimes you'll hear even like on the street, people ranting and raving. And then I think, oh, this person is really suffering. Because I've I've experienced, you know, maybe I didn't rant and rave on the street, but internally ranting and raving like that. And so over the years, I've seen it decrease. It's it's a It's a lifelong... <laughs> this don't be impatient. But patience is uh, one of the best uh, qualities to cultivate in oneself. One of, the, one of the best wholesome qualities to cultivate, because uh, for ourselves and for others. But it's a long path. It's a gradual path. But uh, if you've been practicing for a while, look back and say, "Oh, I remember." You know, this it was much more difficult. Or uh, I can see the progress in myself if I look back five years, if I look back ten years, if I look back twenty years. <laughs> it's been forty years for me. <laughs> I still have work to do. <laughs> but um, So caring for oneself, we care for others. And there's a, a beautiful um, story in the, it's again in the Samyutta Nikaya, and it's in the, oh, the, the last one was the um, Dhammapada, but the first one was from the Samyutta Nikaya. Um, it's a beautiful story. Uh, the Lord Buddha is with the, the bhikkhus, and uh, he was he's talking about the two acrobats. Some of you may know the story. Uh, and uh, so the Buddha said, once there were these two acrobats, and there was a, the acrobat and the apprentice, and they were going to do this stunt on the bamboo pole. So my understanding is the stunt is the, the one acrobat is going to hold the Whole still, they didn't have, uh, you know, like this whole, you know, elaborate structures that they have these days for acrobats. But the they were portable; their portable stunt pole that they would take pl from place to place. And so, um, one, the the larger one, I imagine the 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 uh, master held the pole still. And then the other acrobat was would climb up on the uh, shoulders of the uh, master. The apprentice would climb up on the shoulders and then climb up the pole, somehow scale up, get up on the pole. And I think there was a, a crossbar and they would do some stunts on the, the, the bamboo pole. So uh, the master said uh, to the apprentice, uh, come and climb up on my shoulders and uh, get up on the pole and I will protect you and you will protect me because either one could get harmed in this uh, uh, stunt that they were doing. And the apprentice says, no, master, that's not, 
the way it is at all. Uh, I will protect myself and you will protect yourself. And then we'll do the the our show our skills and then I'll get down safely from the bamboo pole. And the Buddha said, oh, the, the apprentice was right. Uh, I have the, uh, what the Buddha said here. I'm not going to paraphrase what he said. This is his Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. No, it looks like, yeah, it's Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. Uh, that's the method there, the Blessed One said. It's just what the apprentice said to the teacher. I will protect myself. Thus should the establishments of mindfulness be practiced. I will protect others. Thus the establishments of mindfulness should be practiced. Protecting oneself, one protects others. Protecting others, one protects oneself. So our mindfulness is a protection for ourselves. This is another quality that we um, should be developing. But the idea of we looking looking carefully after ourselves. And then the Buddha continues. And how is it that by protecting oneself, one protects others? By the pursuit, development, and cultivation of the four establishments of mindfulness. It is in such a way that by protecting oneself, one protects others. And how is it that by protecting others, one protects oneself? By patience, harmlessness, loving kindness, and sympathy. It is in such a way that by protecting others, one protects oneself. So these are wholesome qualities. So we're protecting our own minds by not going into unwholesome states. So the Buddha ends, uh, I will protect myself, thus should the establishments of mindfulness be practiced. I will protect others, thus the establishments of mindfulness should be practiced. Protecting oneself, one protects others. Protecting others, one protects oneself. So this is uh, another form of self-love. Uh, and uh, um, this, this uh, kanti, or patience, avihingsa, or harmlessness, metta chitta, this is a mind of, of loving kindness, and anu dayata, and that's sympathy. All these are qualities to cultivate in oneself. And also, I recommend the cultivation of the four Brahma Viharas, including equanimity as well as the development of wisdom. <laughs> and the, it may sound like a lot, but this is a gradual path, and uh, we can emphasize one uh, quality or another. Uh, but this is a basic teaching. So I offer this for your reflection, and I think uh, it's time to go to questions. Uh, sadhu, oh. sadhu, sadhu, Anubhuta. I, Yannicka, do you have anything you'd like to add? No, no, we'll okay. see where it goes. Okay. So we have two people in the live audience here. Is there a question here from them? Okay, then we'll go online first. If you have any questions, please um, raise your hand so I can unmute you. Looks like Terry has a hand. Yes, hello. Thank you for your talk. Um, I'm still confused about what is non-self. Um, I could understand about the concept of um, 
loving kindness to yourself. That if you don't love yourself, you can't love others. But when we look at what non-self means, I find um, it's all a bit abstract. And it's part of um, Buddhism I tend to leave alone because I don't understand it. So I just leave it to one side. I don't, um, it's not a, it's not a part of my Buddhism or how I think of Buddhism that I need to delve into uh, because I'm so unsure of what it's all about anyway. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, I understand that. And um, I think that this is the reason why I brought this up because some people do try to delve into it or think that that's what they should be doing. And it may be just too soon in their development to really uh, be able to understand it well enough that it isn't, con like you're saying, it's confusing. So to be developing, abandoning the unwholesome qualities and developing the wholesome qualities is the first part of the path. And so thank you for bringing that up because I was going to say a little bit more about non-self. But um, if you think, yeah, there is this conventional self. There's this, like the five aggregates is, can be uh, short, shortened into nama rupa, which is name and form. So it's our, our uh, um, mentality and materiality. And then all of that is in constant flux. And uh, we know we're not the same person we were when we were a teenager, either physically, mentally, all, you know, like to so much has changed. It's just not the same person at all. And so, uh, so we could kind of understand it in that, uh, to that, to that degree. Uh, and, but it is a, a wisdom practice. It is something that uh, one one reason why you look at non-self is the attachment to the self, and um, to kind of loosen that that grip of attachment. And uh, but I, it's dangerous if we don't have a really well-established uh, ethical sense of self, uh, in, uh, really uh, self with integrity. Uh, if we don't have a stable, you know, you know, we aren't stable mentally, then it can be very dangerous, actually, uh, because then we'll get a, dist a distorted view of non-self. <laughs> it, it won't be the correct view of non-self. And it does take a lot of maturity in the practice to be able uh, to uh, really deeply understand, to have deep insight with it. and. There is a mistake. Uh, people go on these retreats and there's too much emphasis on insight practice and it's too soon for a lot of people. Uh, you can start with um, impermanence is the easiest one. It's very, it's very obvious and, it's, and that does relate to non-self. Um, so the, in the Buddhist teaching, uh, it avoids extremes so we want to have a balanced view it's not like we're just kind of ditching the self that's how i was talking about annihilationism and we don't want to uh overindulge the self or, or, or fluff fluff up <laughs> or, or try to you know crystallize this idea of a, of a self <laughs> it's like um we're trying to see things in accordance with reality this is what uh, the Buddha's teaching is about. And so uh, this is one of the things that uh, the Buddha brings to light, but we're not we're not able to see it until we're ready to. Yeah. And then there's stages of seeing it, like the uh, when we see the khandas, where I can, can't say any of these khandas are self. And this is when we enter the stream, but it doesn't mean that we uh, don't know that we don't think there's a conventional self, this being here, 
<laughs> we're not completely free of the conceit of I am at that point. And so uh, so some people get to that po point, but the, um, and they're not completely free of defilements either at that point, but it, it's it's loosening up this grip of of self that keeps us in samsara. So I hope that's helpful. And I see it. there's another hand. Is Darren? Um, thank you, Venerables. Um, thank you also, Minori and Mateus, for your service every week. Um, I'm not quite sure my question is or may know what the answer to the question is. Um, hearing the meditation and the talks all around um, self-compassion is there's a sense of irony because it's been on my mind um, for the last few weeks and I think for most of my life I've had a I've probably got a lifetime of PhDs of not being compassionate to myself um, and I'm quite an expert in that uh, and I think where I'm getting stuck with it is um I know that I should I should be having compassion for myself. Um and I'm thinking, well, that's not compassionate. Um, and then I'm 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 stuck in this sort of vicious circle. Um and I think I, I have or not, I think I I know that I've got this awareness um around it. Um and I suppose something else you said about um the attachment, and I suppose Perhaps I've got the attachment to, to having compassion to myself um, and the and the grasping, and, and instead just um, I think one of my favourite analogies is sort of sitting on the riverbank and watching the river of my emotions just flow by and not jumping in, and it feels like I just keep jumping in um, mm -hmm. and knowing that yeah, no, I'm, I must be on the side, um, but then trying to fight to get to the side when if I just float in the river, then I'll get to a point where the river's going to be calmer and it'll be easier to get out. Um, so I think I'm answering my own question of just um, be be patient and let things flow and let things be. Uh, but I would appreciate some more your wisdom on it, please. So... Um... I call this sometimes I call it adding uh, defilement to defilement when we get angry at ourselves for <laughs> for having defilements and it kind of goes around the, or I should be having more compassion for myself and this should and so you're catching yourself and you're seeing that the, the kind of a conundrum that that is and uh, or a vicious cycle or something like that so uh, then you can like step back and go oh there's that. Uh, I got a critical voice. I see that critical voice again. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and just kind of examine, oh, is, it, is this really helpful to be uh, upset with myself for not being compassionate? I know I'm only laughing because it's just like human nature. So, so we, could, we, we, I, you know, something to, to that effect, I've, I've been, uh, you know, like worked with also just like, uh, no, you shouldn't be getting angry and getting angry at myself for <laughs> getting so that yeah. So it is a, a vicious cycle, and so just seeing it. Oh, there's this vicious cycle again that's uh, arising, and stepping back. Isn't it? <laughs> it was, what did you say? A PhD? <laughs> um, yeah. So um, yeah. So being uh, patient, like you're saying. There is a, the, when you were speaking, there's a, a sutta, it's the very first sutta and the Samyutta Nikaya and the connected discourses and the, uh, the a deva appears before the Buddha and said, how, how did you cross the flood? And he said, the Lord Buddha says, uh, well, not by start striving and not by standing still. And then the Buddha said, well, how did you cross the flood in that, by that way you know i forget that exactly what the devata said but uh the buddha said well um when i struggled i got swept around and when i stood still i sunk and that's uh so not not going to either extreme is basically what he was saying he crossed the flood so not striving too hard or not just 
giving up. So we just kind of gradually, if you've ever crossed a, you know, like forded a river, you know, you got to just kind of, you got to keep going and, but you got to really step carefully and uh, you can't, you know, like go against the, the, the current. You can't struggle against the current or you get swept away. And you're not going to just stand there or else you'll, yes, yeah, gets you might sink is what he's saying. So hopefully that's helpful. I can also, I can add, being of a, a like mind, I, or before ordaining, I remember being in a, a relaxation yoga class and the teacher saying, okay, now relax your lower back. And I'm looking at my lower back mentally and I, and then I swore at my low back because it was not relaxing. You know, <laughs> and I realized, oh, what is the sensation of this attitude towards the practice? What is the the sensation of this? And what is the conditioning for it? So you were you were speaking very much of being conditioned toward, you know, this this uh more punitive style, judgmental style. Um pick it up and go do it style. Uh, and so what I've adapted is to see the conditioning. It's like, of course, I'm responding like that right now. Of course, I'm a conditioned being. The stream, the flow has been like this for not j probably just this lifetime, for many lifetimes. The flow of my reactions to how I, I try to take up the wholesome qualities of self-compassion <laughs> are like this because I've conditioned over this lifetime or many lifetimes in this way. And having that softness around an understanding of how did I get into this predicament, it brings up, I think you can hear the humor when Aya Sivijana is talking about it. Oh, and so there becomes this light, warm heartedness about the exact way we end up treating ourselves in a way that's counter to the way that we're attempting to treat ourselves. And it, you can see the humor in it. You can see the conditionality in it. And that gives a little bit of space. And you can go back to that sensation of what does it feel like to struggle? And what does it feel like to succumb? What is it? And, and then you begin to find the right way to move through the stream toward the, the behaviors that are wholesome. So you're you're exactly in the the realm of of beginning to have the the abilities to taste how you got to where you are, so you can start to compassionately adjust your capacity for compassion. Does that make any sense? What is that? Yeah, Language absolutely there? perfect sense. Thank you, okay. thank you both so much. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Are there any more questions? I think in the chat, people, uh, someone has put in links to the to that Sutta. Yes, okay. yes. So, so the links uh, on Sutta Central, good resource to be able to pull up the suttas that I has mentioned today. Yeah, I what I love about the Dwaita Vitaka Sutta is the Lord Buddha was. Um, He'd been doing all these ascetic practices, and there was kind of self torment. And then um, he got to a point where he said, "This is not the way at all." And so um, he gave up that self torment and started to practice the middle way. But he was looking at his own mind and examining his own mind and seeing, uh, "Oh, there's harmful qualities here," and he just kind of like. Well, this is harmful, and it, if if I uh, acted or spoke on this uh, with this quality, would that be helpful or harmful? And it's, it's harmful. So he's and then it. What happened is that it it abated it, it the 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 harmful uh, mental quality like hate or cruelty or greed. Just dissipated when he saw the harm in it and then when he saw the benefit of the uh, uh, kindness of um, 
of uh, love, of uh, renunciation. And then uh, he saw no harm in it, so it, it uplifted his heart. So just kind of being honest with ourselves. This is a, a just seeing and that, that sense of humor, a little sense of humor, acceptance and compassion <laughs> or just, yeah, um, patience. Mm -hmm. uh, these are all qualities that, that take time to develop. But yeah, it is, I think just stepping back too, when I just step back into it, oh, that's anger arising, isn't it? Now, what did the Buddha say about <laughs> anger now? <laughs> Is this going to be helpful? <laughs> I want to tell that so-and-so off. Is that a good idea? <laughs> Especially when the so-and-so is ourselves. <laughs> yeah. So that that's, uh, you can see what my prevailing Achilles is still. <laughs> it's, it, but it is better. It's gotten a lot better. <laughs> There's a lot less, a lot less. I catch you. Uh, you catch your your um, the difficult qualities sooner. Uh, the more you you're in this practice, and the more you keep up with it. Even like washing it, I'll, you know, I'm washing the dishes. I'm aware of what's arising in my mind. I try to keep mindful about what I'm actually doing, but those thoughts keep popping up. <laughs> So was there nothing, no question in the chat, I guess? No, no, no. There was something that's, oh, ask to unmute. That's just the standard. Yeah. So um, is it about time to end, or is there uh, something I uh, that the hosts here would like to say? Um, yes. Uh, can I, uh, before I say, can I ask one final question, Venerable? Certainly. You were mentioning about the 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 ogre, the 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 stream, and so all these. Um, our emotions, you know, our habits we have, you know, the way we think we have brought from maybe many life, lifetimes, that kind of stuck me. Um, so as Darren said, when we come up, you know, we've, we've got these habits of um, maybe maybe being hard to ourselves, maybe getting angry at ourselves. And um, I suppose, uh, uh, you know, so we want to stop it, but then we would have developed it and kind of made it very so strong over a lifetime. So that means that um, we'll have to um, practice patience. Is it like, you know, you were talking about the qualities, the Brahma Viharas and the patience earlier, and I was kind of linking both of them, or maybe uh, we need to have tons of patience with all these things. Yeah, this is the highest austerity. Is that the the Buddha says this patience is the highest austerity. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so yeah, patience with ourselves, and that helps with the patience for other people. And um, just knowing, yeah, I, I can't just snap my finger and make the key laces go away. I can't make the unwholesome mental qualities vanish, and I can't make the Wholesome qualities just appear out of nowhere. Uh, yeah, it takes work. It's like a, you know, it's even harder than exercising the body. You know, people have goals and things like that. And still, that's quite difficult even. <laughs> so, um, yeah, if you have it uh, like a mother, a, a, a mother with a child, and uh, the mind is like, I think I heard, I heard uh, Ajahn Chah use this simile, and I think it works really well. You want to be kind, but you have to be firm sometimes. And I, I know sometimes I see myself again and again uh, falling into the same uh, unwholesome states or something. And then sometimes you just have to say, no, don't. Don't indulge in this. No, <laughs> this is not a good idea. <laughs> and but still but kindly you know like a kind 
a wise parent would would be with the child uh, and uh, and the child is going to grow over time. It's just like your mat practice matures over time. You can't expect a two year old to do something that a fourteen year old is capable of doing. So you think, okay, where am I? <laughs> am I cap Am I capable to grow here though? Mm -hmm. uh, I uh, you know, and what is it that's going to catch my interest so that I will pursue this? You know, this is another thing with children. You have to. The child has to want to do it. The child is not, you know, the child has to see the importance of it and want to do it. Anyone that's been a parent <laughs> knows this. Certain children can be obedient, but they're all the, uh, but still they just, there has to be some kind of motivation. And if the motivation is because they see the benefit. So uh, seeing the benefit for ourselves and seeing the harm for ourselves uh, to avoid those the things that are harmful. So, so it takes a maturing and wisdom as as well as uh, a little bit of <laughs> restraint <laughs> and a lot of kindness, a lot of patience and kindness. Yeah. Also, uh, so so I feel like a practical way that I worked with this. Oh, like I gave the example with the yoga, I look to see what words were or or physical tensing, what actions were arising at that point at which I was following the conditioned, unwholesome, unhealthy response. And one of mine was I was calling myself stupid. And there was kind of this finger pointing way my embodiment was uh, pointing at myself and putting myself down because I wasn't changing or I wasn't doing something or you know whatever. And so I could hear that word stupid in my head as as a behavior. And at other times it's been an action that like I'm grabbing for something or I want to push and I feel that. So if I, what I did was I applied mindfulness. At the moment that I begin this behavior that I've done so often, it feels like this, or this word or phrase or sense comes into my heart, my mind, my body. And I would key in on that so I would learn, oh, here's an early warning sign. I'm about to go down this unwholesome path mm -hmm. in regards to myself or others or choices or behaviors. And that wouldn't necessarily mean I was going to be capable of changing it at that moment. I might be right down the slide, but I could start to really notice this, like, oh, here's the first sign of, of this behavior. And then, so in the case of calling myself stupid, I thought, what could I use instead? So I picked the same first, sweetheart. And I began to try and catch sweetheart, sweetheart. And so I reconditioned. My mindfulness would catch. I'm starting down that behavior pattern that I know is not, not health, so not helpful. Sweetheart. And I will tell you that 10 years down the line, <laughs> Sweetheart is my natural go-to in what arises in my mind when I'm talking to myself. It's like an icon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The icon that pops up in my message stream now is is a heart, not a, not a finger. So this is how we do it. And it takes patience. It takes practice. It takes a commitment to the mindfulness. We have that's why there needs to be enough self-love to say, I'm willing to go through this this mm -hmm. difficulty of repeatedly seeing how I treat myself or others or my practice. Oh, thank you. That's great. Yeah. That's the same. Same with me with the when I see that little critical voice. <laughs> Oh, there, but I, I'm i more like, oh, there's that critical voice again. I see that. <laughs> it's like, yeah, so we all have our own um, methods cool to, to un, un, uncondition ourselves from the negative conditioning that we <laughs> we nurture in ourselves. So we de-nurture 
yeah, be un unwholesome, and we nurture what's wholesome. So yeah, that's a whole other sort of su suttas for a different yeah, day. Yeah, but but the but yeah, so everybody ha will develop their own things like that. I think if in yourself when you see, oh, I see that, you know, but seeing it, acknowledge, acknowledging it is a acknowledge oh i don't know the three maybe my tree knows what's it what what does Ajahn Brahm say so you, first you acknowledge it you let go and learn or something like that i think that's what it is you acknowledge that you made a mistake and then you uh maybe you learn and then you let go <laughs> something to that effect acknowledge forgive, forgive and, and learn, learn. Fantastic. Oh, thank you. Yes, that's that's what I was trying to. Figure. Yeah, so the, there's all these little um, um, keys or icons. <laughs> icons, I like that. I'm going to use that one in the future. When that icon pops up, you go, oh, yeah, I could respond like this. Hmm. Yeah, um, if, if I remember correctly, yes. That sounds yeah, good. Good enough. Close enough. It, it's useful as stated. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're at the end of our time. Yeah. 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 So thank you very much for both Aya Suvichana and Aya Nyanika meditation and the Dhamma talk today. It is a, a very deep subject of non-self, isn't it? And, uh, and self-compassion, very, very difficult subject. And uh, thank you for giving us opportunity to discuss and uh, question you, understand these teachings, uh, getting into, uh, you know, deeper our parts. So as you know, today's teaching was offered on a donation basis. And uh, this is, um, this is, this is a kind of an opportunity, uh, the way I look at it is um, to develop our generosity. Um, you have Anukampa Bhikkhuni project and you have the Pasadi Vihara is new upcoming as well. And um, um, so the dana is uh, to develop ourselves as well and show our generosity. So if you are able, um, uh, you can do financial donations, that is a dana, or you can um, get involved uh, you can volunteer, you can provide an actual dana, a food dana. There are so many ways that uh, you can you can um, uh, get together and uh, practice your dana. And uh, uh, yes, Matthias, has, we put the uh, donation link in Anukampa project. And uh, if you are able, please go to Pasadi Vihara also and see what they are doing. There is a lot of talks uh, as well. And there's a YouTube channel as well. Um, and uh, thank you very much for coming and uh, supporting the Anukampa Bikuni project and the community. Uh, because of the community, we've got our monastery, the new monastery, and uh, which will um, ha which has space for new Bikunis to ordain and um, a lot more talks and retreats uh, as well in the future. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Sorry, sorry. Thank you all for uh, your kind attention. <laughs>